we survived youth camp, thank the Lord, and uh, took a good nap afterwards. And uh, I'm recovering all my, from all of my injuries, and I pray that the rest of the adults are as well. Someone said they looked at the pictures on Facebook, said it looked like I was a Superman out there doing athletic events with the kids, but I assure you I did not feel like Superman at all. But uh, we're thankful for everything that the Lord did this past week at youth camp. Um, I want you to think about something and don't overthink it. It's very simple, but think about it with me. Um, if you take a, fl- a sunflower seed, not a fun flower seed, a sunflower seed, and you plant it in good soil, make sure it has plenty of sunlight, and give it just the right amount of water, what is going to happen? It's going to grow. What are you going to have? A sunflower, right? It's very, very simple. A sunflower is going to grow because God enables that to happen. God has placed that ability within nature. It's something that God has given nature the ability to do. God has ordered it in creation. Is there any chance that an apple tree will grow from that? No. If it does, that means that wasn't a sunflower seed. Okay? There's no chance. Is there a chance that a, a rose is going to grow from that? None whatsoever. Okay? And, and that seems quite obvious. It sounds very simple. And you may think, why are you even bothering with this? This is something that a kindergartner could understand. But we have a very, very serious problem in our world. As humans, as sinners, as Christians, we have a very serious problem in that we plant seeds all the time. We plant seeds, and then we expect either nothing to grow or something else to grow. We do that all the time. Plant seeds, and then we expect nothing to grow or we expect something else to grow. We'll get into that more in a moment. For now, take your Bibles. Turn with me to Judges chapter 9, the Old Testament book of Judges, and the ninth chapter, and that's the seventh book in your Bible if you're not familiar with the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and uh, if you're using one of the pew Bibles, that's page 287, I believe, 287, Judges chapter 9. Um, And so, as I said, we got back from youth camp on Thursday, had a great time, we're very, very thankful for those who came with us and helped, those of you that prayed as you were asked to pray last week, and I believe many of you did that. I'm very thankful for that. Uh, For those that volunteered, those that brought out meals, those that donated things, those that donated so that those who could not afford to go could go. We're we're just thankful for for every single bit of it. Our, Our theme throughout the week at camp was firm foundation based off of Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, in which Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. On this rock, I will build my church. And in that passage, if you're familiar with it, Jesus was referring to himself. He's referring to the confession that Peter just made, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It is upon Jesus that the church is built. It is upon faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the only hope of salvation. It is upon that that the church is built. He is the firm foundation. He's the foundation of everything. And that's kind of what we talked about throughout the week. He's the foundation of our faith. He's the foundation of the church. Uh, But not only that, he is the foundation of life itself. He's the foundation of a good godly government. He is the foundation of a good marriage. He's the foundation of everything. And so one of the passages that I preached on was Matthew chapter 7 in verses 24 through 27. There at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, I want to read that to you. Jesus said, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall. Why? For it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. You see, Jesus is the foundation of it all. You must build your house upon the rock. You must build it upon Jesus. Your eternal life must be built upon Jesus through faith in Christ and His work on the cross and through the resurrection. Your eternity is built on the rock. When God's judgment comes, it will stand. 
It will stand. It is a firm foundation. You have a home in heaven. It is certain. Nothing can change that. Nothing can take that away. And I'm thankful for that. It's a firm foundation. But not only that, we see in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus' teachings are a firm foundation. And if you build your life on the teachings of Jesus, you have a house that is built on the rock, and when storms come, it will not fall. You see, when you build your life on the teachings of Jesus, you will withstand storms. But when your life is built on anything else, your house is built on, sta- on sand. And when storms come, what will happen? Your house will fall. And it will be a great fall. So building your house on the rock produces good results. Right? But building your house on the sand produces bad results. It ends up costing you. Actions have results. Planting seeds produces what? Fruit. When you plant a seed, it produces something. If you sow, you will reap. And so I want to share with you an Old Testament passage this morning that teaches us this principle about as well as any other story in the Bible. So the book of Judges covers a period of history in Israel that takes place after the death of Joshua and after Israel has entered into the promised land. But when Israel entered into the promised land, they were supposed to remove all the pagan nations that were dwelling there and have the land for themselves. Well, they went in, they fought some battles, they removed a lot of people, but they didn't do all that they were supposed to do. They left some of those pagan nations that were dwelling in the land there, and they chose to get comfortable with them. And that caused a lot of lot of problems in this period of history. That's why we read about really, really terrible, terrible times in the book of Judges. And so it's described multiple times in this book where it says that there was no king in the land and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was no king and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so due to this wickedness in the land, due to the the lack of a king, God would raise up certain leaders, certain judges, and that's where we get the name of the book of Judges, who would deliver the people from battle and he he would call out wickedness, he would call Israel to repentance and and he would deliver them and battle. And so this is a story that we have here that really illustrates very well that our actions have results. Our actions have consequences. Just as we talked about, if you build your house on the rock, there are good consequences from that. If you build your house on the sand, there are terrible consequences that come from that. And this is something we need to understand. When we plant things, certain things are going to grow from that. So let's go ahead and begin reading now in verse 1. Then Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, went to Shechem to his mother's brothers and spoke with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem, which is better for you, that all seventy of the sons of Jeroboam reign over you, or that one reign over you? Remember that I am your own flesh and bone. And so we're introduced to this man named Abimelech here at the beginning of our story, and he is the antagonist. He's a bad dude. It does not appear that he is a judge, but that's beside the point. This Abimelech is the son of Jeroboam. Now, Jeroboam is the name that is given to Gideon there at the end of the previous chapter. So Abimelech is Gideon's son, and many of you are probably familiar with Gideon, probably learned about him in Sunday school and in children's church as the one who was hiding there, but eventually God called him a a man of valor and told him to go out and do what he was called to do. And so uh, Jeroboam has this son named Abimelech. And this son, Abimelech, is Gideon's son from a concubine that Gideon had. So uh, in a concubine, if you're not familiar, a concubine was basically a half-wife, half-girlfriend. It's kind of like an exalted side chick, if you will. Uh, They they were in covenant with them, uh, but it didn't sound, sound so nice saying that you had a second wife, so they would call it a concubine. But really, all it was was adultery. It was just another form of adultery that they tried to make sound better. Well, we're not really wives, so I'm not really committing adultery. I don't have multiple wives. I just have a concubine. But it was wicked. It was absolutely wicked. And and Abimelech is the result of that wicked relationship between Gideon and his concubine. He was born from that adulterous relationship. Now, that doesn't mean that God cannot use him. Solomon was the result of an adulterous relationship as well. And so there's no excuse here for the way Abimelech's going to behave himself. 
And so Abimelech goes to Shechem, where his people are, where his family is, and he speaks with them, and he, and he begins this campaign to try to become their leader. He says, y'all don't want 70 of my brothers ruling over you, do you? That, that would not be good. To have 70 rulers, that would just seem really, really oppressive. That doesn't sound so good. It would be confusing. You'd have this one saying this thing, and this one saying another thing. Wouldn't it be better if you just had one ruler? And hey, here's an idea. How about me? I, I could do that for you, couldn't I? Doesn't that sound good? And remember, I'm your family, so this just, this, it just makes sense for me to be your ruler. So that's a summary of his political campaign. Verse 3, And his mother's brothers spoke all these words concerning him in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. And their heart was inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. So they gave him seventy shekels of silver from the temple of baal with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless men, and they followed him. Then he went to his father's house, at Ophrah, and killed his brothers, the seventy sons of Jeroboam, on one stone. But Jotham, the, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, because he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, all of Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king beside the terebinth tree at the pillar that was in Shechem. So Abimelech's mother and brothers, all of their family members, they sit down, they talk about it. They, they, they've, they said, we've heard, what, we've heard his, uh, his campaign speech. What do we think? And they decide it sounds pretty good. And so they're ready to hire him. And so they hire him. They make them king. And I don't know why they're so easily swayed. They would do better to say, no, no man's going to rule over us. God is going to be our king, as is his desire. But they just choose him. Abimelech just shows up and says, hey, I think I should be your leader. And they say, that sounds pretty good. They just assume he has good intentions and that it's all going to work out. Just fine. So Abimelech is now the king of Shechem. And his first act as king is that he goes out, he hires a bunch of worthless people to follow him around, his entourage. And then he goes out and he kills all 70 of his brothers so that he has no one to challenge his authority. The lengths that evil men will go to in order to have power and to have authority. He hired a group of scoundrels. He tied his brothers up there on a stone and he killed them all at that stone. Except for one brother, Jotham. Now, when they told Jotham, verse 7, Now, when they told Jotham, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim, and lifted his voice and cried out. And he said to them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. So Abimelech kills all his brothers, but there was another who escaped and lived on. That's Jotham. And so after Abimelech begins wielding his power and is acting evil, and they're watching this, they begin to get a little bit worried. And so they reach out to that last living brother, Jotham, and they ask him if he can help them in any way. And so he begins to share a parable with them. And he says, tells them to listen to this message from the Lord. Look at the beginning of it in verse 8. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, Reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, Should I cease giving my oil, with which they honor God and men, and go to, to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the fig tree, You come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit, and go to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the vine, You come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, should I cease my new wine, which cheers both God and men, and go to sway over trees? Verse 14, Then all the trees said to the bramble, You come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So Jotham is speaking on behalf of the Lord, sharing a parable with them to kind of show them what they've done. He's trying to teach them a lesson. The parable is about these trees, and they, they reach out to an olive tree, and they say, we want you to be our leader. But the olive tree says, no, I can't do that. And, and the fig tree, but the fig tree can't do it. And the vine, and the vine can't do that either. You see, there were plenty of qualified people who could be leaders among them, but none of them were willing to stand up and be leaders. And instead, a bramble, which would be a, a, a tangly, prickly shrub. Something that is not really any good to be king. And they make that their king. Who's that bramble to represent? Abimelech. He was never really any good to be king, yet they made him king. 
Verse 16. Now, therefore, if you have acted in truth and sincerity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jeroboam and his house and have done to him as he deserves, for my father fought for you, risked his life, and delivered you out of the hand of Midian, but you have risen up against my father's house this day and killed his 70 sons on one stone and made Abimelech, the son of his female servant, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If then you have acted in truth, and sincerity with Jeroboam and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled, and he went to Beer, he was an alcoholic, and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. So Jotham warns them, that if they want Abimelech to be their king, and they support the killing of those, those brothers, then they're going to deal with the consequences they've made. But he's giving them an opportunity to repent, to change their mind. He says, if you've dealt with him in truth, if this is what you really want, then have at it. Then have at it, but there's going to be consequences for it. There's going to be consequences for you, and there's going to be consequences for Abimelech. And Jotham says that fire will devour the men of Shechem. Verse 22. After Abimelech had reigned over Israel three years, God sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dwelt, uh, dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the crime done to the seventy sons of Jeroboam might be settled, and their blood be laid on Abimelech their brother, who killed them, and on the men of Shechem who aided him in the killing of his brothers. And the men of Shechem set men in ambush against him on the tops of the mountains. And they robbed all who passed by them along the way, and it was told Abimelech. So three years have gone by. They haven't even got through a, a full presidential term already, and they are fed up. They're tired of it. They're sick of it. Abimelech has been ruling over Shechem. The people are done. They've had enough. And their plan is to wait along the mountains and to eventually ambush and kill Abimelech. Now, you may not like your king, but they have no right to do this. This is a wicked thing that they're trying to do. They made their choice. They made the bed, and now they have to lie in it. But they want to try to escape it. They had their opportunity, and it's too late. And so we're seeing that this foolish decision of the people of Shechem to anoint Abimelech as king, it's not only negatively affecting the people of Shechem, but it's also negatively affecting Abimelech. Remember, he made foolish choices as well. And now his life is in danger. There are people that are ready to kill him. So you can, you can scratch and claw and try to tear people down and kill and still to have power, but it will never make things good for you. But that's what we see Abimelech trying to do. Kills to have power, and he thinks it's all going to, to be well. And we wonder sometimes, man, why are the wicked prospering? But just wait. God's judgment will come eventually. Verse 26. Now Gaal, the son of Ebed, came with his brothers and went over to Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. So they went out into the fields and gathered grapes from their vineyards and trod them and made merry. And they went into the house of their God and ate and drank and cursed Abimelech. Then Gaal, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jeroboam? And is not Zebel his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. But why should we serve him? If only this people were under my authority, then I would remove Abimelech. So he said to Abimelech, increase your army and come out. So now the people of Shechem, they've lost confidence in Abimelech as their king. And so they put their confidence in this dude named Gaal. And rather than learning their lesson and just serving God, they choose another wicked guy to be their king, and they put their confidence in him. And he's going, this is the one that they're depending on to deliver them from the evil, oppressive rule of Abimelech. And they go to the house of their God, which was probably some sort of idol temple, and they're having a drunken celebration with their new leader, Gaal. Just a big drunken party, and even their leader, Gaal, is drunk. And in his drunkenness, he starts 
acting ridiculously stupid, as people do when they're disobeying God's word by involving themselves in drunkenness. And he begins to talk trash to Abimelech, even though Abimelech isn't even around. He's challenging him to a fight. You can just imagine this dude drunk out of his mind, and he's just yelling at someone that's not even there, saying, come on, Abimelech, let's do this. Let's, let's throw hands. Let's fight. Come on. I'm not scared of you. And nobody's even there to fight him. He's just talking to the wind. He says, you're just a loser, Abimelech. Let's fight. Verse 30. When Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaal, the son of Ebed, his anger was aroused. And he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly, saying, Take note, Gaal, the son of Ebed, and his brothers have come to Shechem, and here they are, fortifying the city against you. Now, now therefore, get up by night, you and the people who are with you, and lie in wait in the field. And it shall be, as soon as the sun is up in the morning, that you shall rise early and rush upon the city. And when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you may then do to them as you find opportunity. So we have this man, Zebel, who was probably a servant of Abimelech, and he overhears these words of uh, Gaal, and he goes and he warns Abimelech about them. So now Abimelech has a man on the inside, a spy who can relay this information to him. And so he tells him, he warns him that they're coming to, and they, 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 they want to harm Abimelech. And so he tells him, you might as well get some kind of army ready because this is going to end in battle. And so he hears those words and he begins to get an army ready. Verse 34, so Abimelech and all the people who were with him rose by night and lay in wait against Shechem in four companies. When Gaal, the son of Ebed, went out and stood in the entrance to the city gate, Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from lying in wait. And when Gaal saw the people, he said to, he said to Zebul, Look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. But Zebul, Zebul said to him, You see the shadows of the mountains as if they were men. So Abimelech's army is getting ready, and they're standing out there. They're laying out in the mountains, just waiting to fight. And Zebul goes back to Gaul, and Gaul is not aware that Zebul's been leaking this information to Abimelech. And Gaul is looking out to the mountains, and he sees the people getting up, ready to begin coming down to fight. And so he begins to get a little bit worried, and he says, hey, look, there's people in the mountains. But Gaul says, no, that's, don't worry, that's just the sun. That's just shadows that are being casted as the sun rises. Don't worry, all is well. You're just seeing shadows. Verse 37, so Gaal spoke again and said, see, people, coming are, people are coming down from the, mount, from the center of the land, and another company is coming from the diviner's terebinth tree. Then Zebul said to him, where indeed is your mouth now? With which you said, who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Are not these people whom you despised? Go out, if you will, and fight with them now. So after Zebul tries to convince Gaal that he's just seeing shadows, Gaal realizes, no, this is actually people coming down to fight. He begins to get a little bit worried again. And so Zebul says, hey, come on, man. Remember last night when you were drunk and you were trying to challenge him? You were talking all big like you're a big dude, like you're ready to fight. Where's all that? Let's go. Weren't you despising Abimelech? Weren't you talking trash? It's time to put your money where your mouth is. But Gaal's a little bit scared. He doesn't want to be a man and fight. He's a little bit worried. So verse 39, so Gaal went out leading the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him and he fled from him and many fell wounded to the very entrance of the gate. Then Abimelech dwelt at the Arama. And Zebul drove out Gaal and his brothers so that they would not dwell in Shechem. And it came about on the next day that the people went out into the field and they told Abimelech. So he took his people, divided them into three companies and lay in wait in the field. And he looked and there were the people coming out of the city. And he rose against them and attacked them. Then Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city. And the other two companies rushed upon all who were in the fields and killed them. So Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He took the city and killed the people who were in it. And he demolished the city and sowed it with salt. Now when all the men of the tower of Shechem had heard that they entered, had heard that they entered the stronghold of the temple of the god Bereth. And it was told Abimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. 
Verse 48, Then Abimelech went up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people who were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bow from the trees and took it in his hand and laid it on his shoulder. And then he said to the people who were with him, What you have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. So each of the people likewise cut down his own bow and followed Abimelech, put them against the stronghold and set the stronghold on fire above them so that all the people of the tower of Shechem died, about a thousand men and women. So this is quite a bloody battle that we read of here with the men of Shechem. It ends with the men of Shechem going up to take refuge in the tower of this false idol's temple. You cannot find refuge in any false god, but that's what they tried to do. They go up to the top of that tower, and Abimelech, from the bottom, sets it on fire, and it kills every one of them. And they were just watched as the fire went up and eventually just devoured them. Now, you may be thinking that sounds kind of crazy, right? How is Abimelech, this dude that killed 70 of his brothers, how is he getting away with this, right? How is he the one that wins? It just does not seem fair. But remember, Jotham warned the men of Shechem that if they really wanted him as the king, they would be devoured by fire. They would suffer the consequences of anointing a wicked king. And yet the story is not over. Verse 50. Then Abimelech went to Thebes, and he encamped against Thebes and took it. But there was a strong tower in the city, and all the men and women, all the people of the city, fled there and shut themselves in. Then they went up to the top of the tower. So Abimelech came as far as the tower and fought against it. And he drew near the door of the tower to burn it with fire. But a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, lest men say of me, a woman killed him. So his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man to his place. Can any man relate? You don't want to be known for getting beat by a girl. I completely understand. That's the worst. So Abimelech, he's, he's ready to keep on fighting. He's ready to keep on going. He's, he's feeling the, the, the rush of adrenaline from, from killing these people. And he keeps on going, ready to continue conquering. He goes to another place to conquer another city. And sure enough, the same type of situation arises. All the people, they run up to the top of the tower. They lock themselves in. And Abimelech is about ready to set this one on fire as well. But at just the right time, a woman drops a big millstone, a big rock on Abimelech's head. And it breaks his skull open. And so he's lying there dying probably with chunks of brain and fluid coming out of his head and his cracked noggin. And he asks his servant to pierce him through with a sword so that he isn't known for being beat by a woman. And that's how prideful Abimelech was, that in his last moments, all he cared about was his reputation. And it didn't work, did it? Because we just read about it and we know what happened. He got beat by a girl. I love it. We're all reading it here. We know what really happened. And it'll always be remembered that way. And so... As you go through this chapter, there's, there's a lot of different lessons that we can learn from it. But what we're dealing, when we're dealing with a section of Scripture, I think the best thing to do is just ask yourself, what is the big picture? What's the big picture? And so what is the big picture? Uh, why have I shared with you this, this long story from the Old Testament that, that may even seem insignificant to us as we read it, what are we to learn from this? What does any of this have to do with any of us? Well, look at the final two verses, verse 56 and 57. Thus, God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father by killing his 70 brothers. And all the evil of the men of Shechem, God returned on their own heads. And on them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. That's the lesson. This entire chapter for that lesson right there. Abimelech was a wicked ruler. And guess what? He got what he deserved. God repaid him for his evil. Also, the people of Shechem made foolish, wicked decisions in refusing God as king and appointing two different wicked men to be their rulers. And they also got what they deserved. God repaid them for their evil. 
That's it. That's the big lesson. That's the big picture. A whole chapter devoted to that? Yes. And it's worth a whole chapter because we need to get this in our heads. We need to understand this and take it to heart. This is a principle that is taught to us throughout Scripture. A principle that closely relates to the idea that when you build on the sand, your house will fall. Your actions have results and consequences. Look at the way it is described for us. Well, you don't have to look there, but just listen to the way it's described for us. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. There are consequences for how you choose to live your life. God will hold you responsible for how you choose to live your life. And we're not talking about karma. Can we be clear about that? This is not karma. There's a good chance some of you have been thinking that as you sat here, and I understand because it's a word that's thrown around in culture all the time. Karma is not biblical. And it amazes me how many Christians believe in it. Okay? Karma is a belief within Buddhism and Hinduism, Taoism, many other mystical religions, but it is not biblical. We're not talking about the universe balancing everything out. You see, even whenever you plant a seed and you give it the right amount of water, you put it in good soil, you give it the right amount of sunlight, it still won't grow unless God has enabled it to grow. So we're not even talking about something that just naturally occurs. We're not talking about, uh, you know, an equal and opposite reaction to every action. We're not talking about something like that. We're talking about God repaying people for what they have done. We're talking about God answering people for what they have done. So it's not that the universe balances everything out and that uh, if you do good things, good things will happen to you. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. No, we're talking about the providence and the sovereignty of God. That God will make you answer and will even make you suffer the consequences for the way that you live your life. And you will also be blessed when you do what is right. And as we say that, we've got to be clear, we're not talking about a prosperity gospel either. We're simply talking about Galatians 6, 7, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And this chapter has clearly shown this to us. Should you appoint a wicked king like Abimelech, it might end in your death. Abimelech put his brothers to death on a stone, and eventually, guess what? A stone knocked him in the head and took him out. Should you put your confidence in a king rather than God? Well, don't be surprised when God doesn't fight your battle for you. It can be very simple. You speed down the highway, should you be surprised when you get a ticket? Maybe God sent that officer to give you a ticket. Should you spend too much money and refuse to tithe? Don't be surprised when you never feel like you have enough and you always feel like you're falling behind. You grow up, you have kids, you never take them uh, to church, you never give them a good biblical spanking, you only take them to church maybe once or twice a month, we'll say that, that's good enough. And then you make them, let to, uh, they get old enough and you say, you know what, they can make their own decisions now, I'm going to let them do what they want, and you let them tell you no, and yell at your face, don't be surprised if they grow up and hate God. You should not be surprised if they grow up and hate God. And listen, I don't know everything about parenting, I'm willing to admit that, but God does. God does. And he teaches us about it. And I know how to read the Bible. But if that's the way you want to raise your children, don't be surprised that they spend the rest of their life in prison. Don't be surprised if they look into your eye and scream at you and tell you they hate you. What should you expect if you don't raise them right? If your young teenager gets to a certain age and you decide that church can be optional for them now, they can make their own decisions. Don't be surprised when they don't want anything to do with church anymore. Should you choose to never discipline your child in your home and you don't give them a good foundation, you don't lead them by example, you don't disciple them because you think, well, they spent 30 minutes with the youth pastor. I don't need to disciple them. No, it's your job as a parent to disciple your young people. It's your job to do that. But should you choose to just forget about all that and think you don't need to do that and then they grow up and you send them off to a godless liberal university, that tells them that they came from monkeys, and you sent them there just because it was prestigious and you wanted to live vicariously through your children so that you can brag about them, don't be surprised when they come home for summer break and say, Mom, Dad, I don't believe in God anymore. This happens all the time. Right. Young people who aren't discipled and their parents saying, oh, we're all good because we took them to church once or twice a month. 
And we've seen this happen throughout history. America, along with the rest of the world, decided many, many years ago that it was okay to own other human beings and beat them and treat them like garbage based off of many other things, based off their social status, based off the color of their skin. And then America had the bloodiest war our nation has ever seen as a consequence of that. And let me tell you, it was worth it. Absolutely worth it. But I believe very strongly that was God's punishment for our wickedness. If you don't like it, I don't care. And America has now butchered tens of millions of precious preborn babies in their mother's wombs. And I don't think we should be surprised when God's judgment is poured out on us for that. Should you choose to view the filth of pornography, don't be surprised when your marriage struggles. Should we as a church refuse to share the gospel with the lost and dying world out there, we shouldn't be surprised if our church dies. Our culture long ago decided that divorce was no big deal any longer, that it was normal, and the church just kept her mouth shut about it. And yes, I know things happen. But we acted like it doesn't matter at all. We treated marriage like buying something from the store, and if you don't like it, just take it back. As long as you get it in there before that receipt says you can. And eventually, fornication got more prevalent. That's premarital sex. Eventually, the same-sex marriage movement began to grow. And now we don't even know how many genders there are, and the movement has taken over the entire alphabet. But the problem started long ago. Do you understand that? It started long ago, and we, we complain about the way it is out there now, but it started long ago in homes of Christians. Bad husbands, bad wives, bad parenting, bad fathers, bad mothers, unfaithfulness, pornography, promiscuity. Those are the seeds of compromise that we planted long and long ago. And now guess what? We're reaping what we've sown. That's what's happening. We're reaping a terrible harvest of sexual sin. And we just want to attack the fruit that we have. We just want to pull the weed up, but we forget about the roots that are down there. We've got lots of other problems. We've given young people unfettered access to social media, to the internet, to whatever music they want to listen to, whatever television and movies they want to watch, and they are being spoon-fed propaganda. And now, they, you, you may not even believe these statistics. I didn't believe them when I read them. 20%, one in five of Generation Z now identifies with some form of homosexuality or transgenderism. One in five. But we should not be surprised by those results. Because that is what we have sown. We have sown that, and now we are reaping the results of what we've sown. We've listened to what culture has told us about how to interact with people, how to think about ourselves, how to, how to view other people. And now, even within the church, we have people that are puffed up with so much pride, they're unwilling to forgive someone for something they did or something they said. In so many ways, we are reaping what we have sown. And I warn you today, that you'll continue to reap what you've sown. Should you go and take a concubine from the women of Shechem and sleep with her, you might end up with a little brat child that grows up, that becomes king of a group of people, and then kills all of his brothers and starts a civil war, and then ends up lying on the ground with a busted skull. Now that may sound a little bit ridiculous, it may sound like a little bit extreme, but that's what we've seen in this chapter, right? We could go on all day with examples, but it would not be that helpful. We just need to understand today that we will reap what we've sown. God will repay your evil or God will repay your good. God will not be mocked. He will not be mocked. If you build your house on sand, God will repay you. You will reap what you've sown when the storms come and your house falls. Now, the most serious way that this could happen for anyone is that if you remain in your sin without coming to Christ for salvation, without building your eternal life, your eternal house on the solid foundation of Christ's perfect worth, work on the cross and through the resurrection, you will reap what, you've sp what you have sown and spend an eternity in hell. You will be given the wages for your sin. Because whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And the wages of sin is death. So stop playing around in sin and Christian to the one who is born again, who does have their faith in Christ. Stop playing around in sin. Grace is not a license to sin. Stop playing around in sin. God is not going to let you get away with it. So to the person who isn't born again, I give you the warning that if you do not come to Christ before it is too late and see to it that His blood covers your sins, you will reap what you've sown by spending an eternity in hell. But to the Christian, 
Understand that though we are saved by God's grace, we will still have consequences for sins in this life. If you don't build your house on the teachings of Christ, when storms come, your house will fall. You will reap what you've sown. So the invitation is very simple today. If you need to come to Christ, I plead with you to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ before it is too late. Call out to Him for salvation, and He is ready to answer. And if you already have, I believe we all have things that we are guilty of that we need to repent of this morning. And maybe, just maybe, when we repent, God will have mercy and turn His judgment away from us before we reap what we've sown. And so I pray that God would help us to turn our hearts back to Him today and allow us to see the wonderful harvest that will spring forth when we sow spiritual.